Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, 100 Years of Lies, Deceit, and Untruth, Reclaiming Israel's Legal Rights After the Mandate for Palestine. My name is Agnes Simani. I'm the Chief Administrative Officer at Canadians for Israel's Legal Rights and your host today. We would like to welcome our panelists, Lieutenant Colonel Morris Hirsch and Robert L. Mayer. We would like to welcome our moderators, Irving Weisdorf, co-chair for Canadians for Israel's Legal Rights, Goldie Steiner, founder and co-chair of Canadians for Israel's Legal Rights, and myself, Agnes Simani. We may not have time for Q&A at the end of this webinar, but please submit your questions in the chat and we will do our best to answer them in our upcoming bulletin. Our webinar will be 90 minutes long and make sure to stay till the end for an emotional surprise. Now, I would like to introduce Goldie Steiner, founder and co-chair of Canadians for Israel's Legal Rights. Thank you, Agnes. I do have to add Geoff Garfield, uh, Clarfield, who is one of the moderators. You didn't mention him. Uh, Geoff, you're being mentioned now. Uh, I want to thank you, Agnes, for your kind words and for your always hard work. Uh, hello, everyone. Shalom, good day, buen, buen dia, bonjour, wherever you are. My name is Goldie Steiner. I'm founder and co-chair of Canadians for Israel's Legal Rights, also known as CILR. I wish to thank all our attendees and welcome back those who have attended some of our previous presentations. To our co-sponsors, our sincere appreciation for helping us gather such an impressively large audience. As of yesterday, we had 726 registrations. And special thanks to our collaborator and loyal friend, Mark Vandermas. About CILR, I was, bear with me for a moment. Our mission, I can describe in three simple words, education, education, education. One, who we are, two, where we come from, three, where we are going. One, I will quote Menachem Begin, who said about who we are, we are Jews not with trembling knees. Two, where we come from, we are the indigenous people of Eres Israel. And three, true to our mission, our focus is on educating the next generation. To that end, we have two educational projects in the making, geared to fight anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism in schools. To find out more about these projects, please follow us on social media and our bulletins, where they will be published as soon as they are finalized. And now I call on Josh Lent to introduce yourself and bring greetings from Im Tirzu, our wonderful and cherished Israeli partners. Josh. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Josh Lent. I'm a director of external relations at Imtirtsu. Uh, I'd like to uh, play a message by our chairman of the board, Douglas Altebeth, who expresses his regrets for not being able to come tonight. David, can you please play the video? Hello, everyone. This is Douglas Altebeth. I am the chairman of the board of Imtirtsu, Israel's largest grassroots Zionist organization. And we are very proud to be partnering yet again with our friends at Canadians for Israel's Legal Rights in what I'm sure will be a informative, educational, and inspiring webinar focusing ultimately on Israel's legitimacy, Israel's legal legitimacy, and the need to defend that legitimacy. You will be hearing from some very well-informed speakers, and I trust that you will come away not only more educated, more enlightened, but more convinced of the rightfulness of our cause. Enjoy the seminar. Thank you, Josh, and wish you success in your new undertakings. Now we begin at the first part of the program. Last but certainly not least, I want to express my profound thanks to our distinguished panelists, Maurice Hirsch for sharing your vast legal expertise and Robert L. Mayers for your debut 
in the public in the public speaking arena and for devoting yourself heart and soul to the task. About Maurice Hirsch, Lieutenant Colonel Maurice Hirsch is an international law expert. He's former chief military prosecutor for Judea and Samaria, specializing in the pros prosecution of terrorists, the Palestinian Authority and the law applied in Judea and Samaria. Maurice was born in South Africa and ed educated in the United Kingdom, completing his law studies before emigrating to Israel. In the course of his military service, he served in a number of senior positions in the Military Advocate General's Corps, including assistant to the legal advisor to Judea and Samaria, head of legal advisor to the Navy, Air Force, ground forces, and home front, and ultimately at the head of the military prosecution for Judea and Samaria. He retired from the IDF after 19 years of service at the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. In an unusual incident, Hirsch represented the IDF and the State of Israel in talks with a UN organization that had released a particularly controversial report. His efforts were recognized as a great success and a further report put out by the same organization was considerably more balanced. Since returning from the IDF, he now acts as head of legal strategies for Palestinian media. Watch, he's senior member of Israel's Defense and Security Forum, research fellow for the Israel Institute for Strategic Studies, and represents victims of terror, and is active in promoting anti-terror legislation. Maurice will be joined and moderated by Geoff Clarfield, a dear friend and supporter of CILR, a widely published and well-known journalist, and also a passionate anthropologist. Maurice, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Cody, for, for your very kind words. Um, I think uh, um, Jeffrey Jeffrey's going to uh, launch us into some questions that the background of uh, um, really Jewish settlement in the land of Israel and what about um, the uh, um, the really fundamental changes of the, the Balfour Declaration and thereafter the mandate and what I'm going to discuss in, in this section of, of the presentation is how the mandate and how the mandate was really betrayed by the British. Um, the second part of the webinar, obviously, will be dealt with by Robert, um, who will be dealing with really the, the more legal side of the mandate, um, its background, and its, um, and its relevance of LISI today. So, uh, Jeffrey, maybe uh, you can uh, launch us off, please. Sure. Thank you very much, Maurice. I'll just start with a couple of sentences so that the audience can understand where I'm coming from and where you're coming from. I'd like to think that I'm representative in some way of the people who are gonna be watching this. And my own experience and understanding of Jewish and Israeli history is such that the persecution of the Jewish people and the betrayal of the mandate was so powerful that one would say at an existential level, there's absolutely no doubt that Israel has a right to exist, but, since 1948, there's been a tendency in Europe and North America, America to question Israel's right to exist on legal grounds, not because the Muslims persecuted the Jews for 1300 years or the Holocaust or any such thing. So as the British say, I'm the man on the Clapham omnibus. I'm the average guy on the street who's faced with a, a dilemma emotionally and historically one feels that Israel has no doubt um, and should be uh, uh, confirmed in its existence. And then there's all these legal experts who are saying Israel is an illegal blot on the landscape of the Near East. So having uh, uh, declared my uh, relative uh, uh, ignorance, I want to start with you, Maurice, by asking you, what was the international legal status of the land of Israel during the 19th century? So, so what I'm going to do uh, um, with uh, your permission of is I'm going to share uh, uh, my screen um, just so that we can actually see um, really a, a series of maps that I'm going to uh, present to the, uh, um, to the audience so that we can go along and, and discuss what we're talking about. When 
really when the world attacks Israel's legitimacy, um, they're really basing themselves on this idea that, that Israel came into, uh, um, into this area of the Middle East, into this area of the world, and really stole something from some other people. Now, your question is so poignant because you have to like, understand the basic history of the area. What you're looking at now on, the, on your screen, I hope, um, is a map of the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire um, ruled really for 400 uh, odd, odd years, already from 1517. Anyone who's really come to, to, to Israel has visited Jerusalem, has seen the big old city walls. They were built by, uh, uh, by the Ottomans um, soon after they conquered the area. And what we're looking at here, I'm just showing it on my screen, is this area that says Syria and then Jerusalem. Well, obviously Syria, Jerusalem isn't part of uh, uh, um, Syria. But from the point of view of the Ottomans, for that 400-year period, we're talking about from 1517 through 1917, 400 years uh, uh, um, almost to the, to, to the day, we're talking about a time where there was no specific uh, um, separate geographical identity for the land of Israel. It was just another one of the provinces of the um, Ottoman Empire. Now, this is an empire which ne wasn't necessarily hostile to Jews. For example, if you go to Hebron, which is really one of my favorite places in the world, because you see the, the history of, of, of Jewish kingship, of Jewish uh, uh, life, and you go and visit the shul, the synagogue, in the Jewish uh, uh, area of Hebron, the shul was built in 1540. The shul is now almost 500 years old in the heart of Hebron. That's where the Jews uh, were living. So the, the legal, really the legal background to answer your question was very simple. This area, this entire area of Israel, and we would later be called Palestine as well, to include here the area of Jordan, was simply just another province of the Ottoman Empire. Um, and that's the, really the easiest way uh, um, to understand it. It had no background. World War I comes along, the Allied forces destroy the Ottomans and, and the Germans, and now this whole area needs to be re-divided up. Okay, thank you. That's, that's very helpful. But um, what I understand is that you're giving us the outside in approach to the, the fact that what Jews will call the land of Israel was merely a part of the Ottoman Empire under the Turks, who are not Arabs, for those of you who are not anthropologists. So uh, I, I want to ask you from the inside out, what is and was the Jewish people relation to the land of Israel? I assume they didn't simply think that they were just a religious minority in the Eastern Mediterranean, the Ottoman empires. Is that a reasonable approach or do you want to rephrase it? it, it it's definitely reasonable. And, 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 let, and, and let me even rephrase that in, in, in a way that is common for most, like. for most people to understand. It's the claim that the Jews are simply um, uh, colonizers that came here in the wake of, of the Second World War, not the First World War, and then just stole the land from uh, uh, the Palestinians. This simply isn't true. Um, this is something which, uh, um, which needs to be uh, uh, similarly addressed in the same way um, through the maps, and I'll show you again. Here on, 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 very, on, on, on a very uh, uh, small slide as possible, I'm giving you somewhere in the region of 70, 80 to 100 years of Jewish history coming back to the land of Israel. Whether it starts in the, 18, in the 1810s with the students of the Vilna Gaon coming uh, um, uh, back and, and starting to make Aliyah, this idea of leaving uh, um, uh, predominantly Eastern Europe and moving uh, to Israel. You also have the movement from some of the Arab, some, from some of the Arab countries. You then have really the big idea of two conflicting ideas one of the movement of the Jews outside of the old city of uh, outside of the old city of Jerusalem, where really there had been a tremendous force for for, for really for hundreds of years, um, occupying that entire area and really running every type of life within the walls of the old city. Um, now suddenly you're moving out, Mishkanot Ananim. I'm sure that you've all seen on the on the outside of the the old city walls um, the famous windmill. Of, of, of Moses Montefiore, uh, and the, the, the suddenly Jewish life is is expanding out because it's a progress. It's a it's it, it's a product of more and more and more Jews coming over time 
into this small area and needing more uh, uh, space to live. Then you start really the whole Zionist movement. Um, when I went for the first time uh, um, with the army, um, they take you to a Poland trip um, to go and really experience the, 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 the disasters of, of the Holocaust. And so we land in one of the airports that you land in in, in Poland to go uh, um, on, on one of these uh, uh, trips is the Katowice airport. So to understand that you're landing suddenly back as officers in the army in Poland, where, uh, uh, where the Nazis and, and, and the Poles spread the blood of, of, of our people, and suddenly you're landing back in Katowice, the start of the Zionist movement, and really moving through there, the creation of all of the agricultural settlements, Petach Tikva, Rishon Lezion, Zichon, Rosh Pina, Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv, uh, we have to understand, is now 113 years old, and um, starting really out in, 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 in 1909, massive Jewish uh, presence in Israel, um, really taking over everything. Jews by already by 1890 were the majority in Israel. Um, and then when, when you have the first census of the British in 1922, you see that in Jerusalem itself, Jews were the outright majority. What do I mean by that? There were more Jews in Jerusalem than any of the others put together, Mohammedans as they were called here, and Christians. Um, that must be the understanding that Jews and Jewish life was very much a dominating force in Israel and coming through to that period of World War I and understanding the changes that had happened uh, um, at the time. So that's really the background of, of, of Jews, keeping that connection with Israel all the time. And then probably 100 years before the Balfour Declaration, starting that mass movement of return uh, um, to Israel. That's wonderful. Um, let me let me hold you on, on that point a little and, and try and push backwards. The, the reason I'm saying that is, um, you know, you're well aware that the Old Testament and the New Testament is no longer taught in the higher institutes of Canada, the states and Europe, um, the journalists and the, uh, the politicians don't know their Bible. I mean, this is something that's happened in your and my lifetime when we were little boys and girls, if I can include Goldie, this was, this was common. So the elites of uh, Europe and North America knew the Bible and they knew the Old Testament. And I think it was um, the late ambassador to the UN from Israel Herzog, who once pulled out the Bible and the UN said, this is the charter of the Jewish people. This is why the land of Israel belongs to us. I, I hope I'm not uh, derailing your thought pattern, but could you comment a little bit uh, upon the fact that at least Jews and Israelis recognize that the Old Testament and the Talmud are, are their charter for, for national existence. This, you know, wh whether you're pro-Israel or anti-Israel, th this has disappeared from, from discourse. Did, could, what, are, what are your subjective and professional thoughts about that? I know Israelis are different. They know their Bible. So, so, so I, so I would like to uh, uh, that, that all Israelis know their Bible and all Israelis um, see the Bible as the source of our, of Israel's legitimacy. Um, but I don't think that is necessarily true. Um, I think that there's a need to understand that there isn't only the biblical legitimacy for Israel's right to exist and Israel's uh, uh, existence, but rather also contemporary uh, um, decisions that have been made by the international community, which, which really intertwine themselves one with the other. For those uh, uh, of, the, of us who are, are, are religious, we know that, uh, at least in Israel last week, we, re we read Parashat e e e Matot, which is talking about the division of, of the land and the idea of when you come back to the land of Israel and how it would be dealt with, um, the idea of the, 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 the two tribes, Reuven and Gad, who wanted to stay on the eastern side of the border, um, really somewhat to an extent reflecting uh, uh, modern day thought. And, and so that is the biblical idea of, of where, where, where we're holding. This, that, it's actually very important for, for this period of the year because these parashiot, these are, are, are portions of the Torah, are always read between the 17th of Tammuz and, uh, uh, um, and, and the 9th of Av. And, and so it's always around this period of time and it's around right. the period of time when, uh, uh, um, when also what we're talking about today, when the mandate was, was given, it was given on the 18th of Tammuz, 
Um, that was at a, 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 a historical date, at least by the, by, the, by the Jewish calendar, on the 24th of July, today, 100 years ago. Right. So if I can, can grasp your last comments, um, I'd like to ask you uh, more about the Balfour Declaration and Mandate, because it implied in, in what you just said is that the non-Jews at the time, the British who had the power and the Jews who were hoping to get some power over their own land and destiny, um, understood this biblical background and understood that in a sense it was driving this uh, continuous return of Jews to the land of Israel to the point where the European powers were willing to take it seriously after what, 2000 years of anti-Semitism. So tell us a little bit about the Balfour Declaration and the establishment of, of the mandate, in, including some lines on San Remo, which even for the most ardent Zionist <laughs> has been scrubbed from history. If you could do that, uh, I'd really yeah, appreciate so, it. So, so Renan, what, we're any about, what we're talking about is the period of, of the First World War. Um, That's right. Are trying to great, gain as much support, external support as possible. Um, the British will make um, two separate offers and commitments one to uh, um, uh, Abdullah, to the, to the Arab nations, and one to the Jews. Um, the, the, the promise to the Jews will be um, set out in the Balfour Declaration. I'll touch on it uh, just uh, uh, quickly, um, because uh, I think uh, Bob is going to uh, talk about it a little bit more in detail afterwards. Um, but uh, um, so, 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 so really what we're talking about is uh, um, the idea of um, Here's the Balfour Declaration. His Majesty's government view but favor the establishment in Palestine of a national homeland for the Jewish people. The first really recognition of, uh, um, of one of the world powers at the time that the Jews would be able to have their, uh, um, have their state, uh, their, their national homeland in this area called Palestine. It's, it's questionable what that area is. I'll touch on it a little bit. But this is really the first, this is the opening move. This is the, uh, uh, the first commitment of the world powers at the time, you have to understand and put it into context. There is no idea of, um, of a United Nations at the time. It is very much uh, um, the, the, the function of uh, uh, um, the world powers um, that, are, that are running everything. And so when you have that commitment from a world power, it's something of, 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 of really great force. Um, the next... Uh, um, the Balfour Declaration must be understood what it is. It's a declaration of policy. It's not a binding document. When, when, you, when you talk about now the, the, the San Remo Conference, it's a different story. This is a, a, um, April 20, 1920. Um, we're seeing the start, really the birth pangs, of this international organization of uh, different countries. And um, they get together in, in San Remo, and they decide that we're going to divide up really, uh, uh, the spoils of war from uh, the defeat of, of the Ottomans, and they all get together and they say, the British are going to be in charge of implementing what was the Balfour Declaration, and we will do it by the means of a, an instrument that's called a mandate. This was a relative mm -hmm. idea at the time. Um, the mandate was something which was then adopted by the League of Nations, which was the predecessor, obviously, of, of the United Nations. Um, and that gave the legitimacy for, uh, um, for the international community to say that this area of land will be set aside by the League of Nations, via the British for one purpose and one purpose only, for creating the Jewish national homeland. Now, for any of you that haven't read the mandate for Palestine, which is the document we're, we're celebrating today, read it. This is probably what, and I say this time and time again, and I cannot stress it enough, it really is probably one of the most Zionistic documents ever written by the international community. Just going through it very quickly, putting into effect, uh, um, this is just a gamble, putting into effect. You're talking about this mandate for Palestine, which emerged from the nascent League of Nations, the kind of ancestor of the United Nations. And it was not a Jewish document as such, is what I'm, I'm understanding from you. It was a Zionist document written by non-Jews, maybe with Jews on the side. Is that right? Exactly. It wasn't a, a, a Jewish document at all. This is the international community saying that 
they recognize the historical connection of the Jewish people with this area called Palestine and the grounds for reconstituting a national homeland, nothing, not starting over, not creating something from, from nothing, but rather recognizing that there once was a Jewish people. The Jewish people lived in this land that was called Israel, that changed its name to Palestine. And that historical connection has carried on even through 2,000 years later. It's a, it's a remarkable historical fact that you're highlighting here. It was almost as if there was a new dawn and a new light and a new hope internationally and for the Jewish people. After 2,000 years, the Jewish people were being recognized as a nation and not as uh, opponents of Christianity or Islam. So, you know, if, when, when, you know, you and people like Mark Vandermas have uh, encouraged me to read this and take it very seriously. I've done it a number of times. Um, it kind of makes me cry because subsequent reading has told me that uh, from almost day one, the British administrators in charge of the mandate betrayed it. Lock, stock, and two smoking barrels. So tell us a little bit about that. What would it be, 1920, 48-year betrayal, systematic and uh, across the board? So you're right. So, so what we're talking about at the moment, um, the original area of the mandate is on the left. It shows the entire area of Israel, including uh, what is today Jordan. Um, the British, the first move of the British was obviously to separate off Transjordan, to make good on their promise uh, uh, to Abdallah, um, to the Arabs who had joined in that effort against the, uh, uh, the Ottomans. And so they already put into the, into the mandate itself the option of separating off this area of Transjordan. What we were left with was the blue and white area, which was meant to be Israel um, and the, the Jewish homeland, but that really from the start was completely betrayed, uh, uh, unfortunately, by the British. Um, it started from really uh, um, into uh, uh, the period of the mandate, and it was always a response to the violence um, from the Arabs, uh, um, inhabitants of Israel, who were unhappy with this idea that there would be a Jewish homeland in the, in, in the land of Israel. Um, that's right. that they uh, uh, um, really ignored. And so we jump very quickly to, to, to this period of time again in 1929, uh, uh, um, the Arab massacre of the Jews. The Arabs will claim that the Jews were saying their psalms in a provocative manner by the Western Wall, and that will be their justification to murder 130 Jews. And the British will set up the Shaw Commission. Now, in the Shaw Commission, Obviously, the, 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 the different uh, um, breaches by the British of the mandate were so extensive um, and, and so many. So I'm only going to touch on a few of them, just trying to, to, yes. to paint a few uh, uh, common themes. Here, for example, 1929, this is the Shaw Commission. They're investigating why the Arabs uh, um, decided uh, um, to, to, to kill the Jews. And one of the, the most amazing claims already the mandate starts in 1920-22. Its purpose is to create the Jewish state. And here they say it's freely admitted no state land was ever provided for the purpose of Jewish settlement. Well, what were you doing with the land then? Where was that land going? Why were you just administering it and not giving it to the Jews for the purpose that you had been given the mandate? The mandate isn't sovereignty by, by the UK. The mandate's purpose was to give over that land uh, to the Jews. The second part, which I, which I uh, highlighted here, nonetheless, the Jews are now in possession of more than a million dunams um, that was purchased by the Jews and frequently at a high price. What was the claim of the Arabs? Well, we've got no land. These Jews that are coming in are taking all our land away. And so here in the Shaw Commission, instead of saying, well, if your land is important to you, don't sell it to the Jews, what the Shaw Commission really did was it really played into that Arab narrative of, well, we sold the land, we've taken the money, even at a high price, but we still want to keep have our cake and still eat it and still keep it whole. Um, and so that was really the first idea of this idea of how would the land in Israel, in Palestine, be divided up? Why was it not given over? That's one theme, land. The second theme is 
the idea of immigration. Well, the Jews are meant to come from all over the world to this new homeland where they will sit on the land that was given to the, to the British for the purpose of creating this Jewish homeland. What do the British already suggest in 1929 as a result of Arab violence? The British policy should be to regulate, as they call it, regulate immigration um, into Palestine. Well, why should it be re regulated? Jews should be allowed to move in freely. At this period of time already, they're, they're imposing restrictions on the number of Jews coming in. Most of the Jews at this stage are coming in from the European countries, from the Western countries. At the same time, you've got massive Arab Im immigration into Israel, uh, um, which is coming across, across the porous borders, whether it be from Syria, from, uh, uh, um, from, from Jordan, um, from Lebanon. And, and so at the same time as the British are now regulating um, the Jewish immigration, the Arab immigration is, is running freely. What do the Arabs learn from that? Violence and the murder of Jews brings about political gain. So you have another commission set up after the Arab riots in 1936. This is the Peel Commission. Now this is really the start of what would be a tremendous change in, in British uh, 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 policy. Um, the Peel Commission for the first time talks about more substantive measures for limiting illegal immigration on the one hand, and then, as you see in the, in the middle of our screen, this first idea of a petition plan. We're now leaving the idea, the paradigm of a two-state solution, one Arab state, which is Jordan, and one Jewish state, which is, uh, 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 which is Israel. And we're now, again, the British are, are, are suggesting this idea of petitioning that small area of land that was given for the purpose of, uh, um, of the Jewish uh, uh, homeland. Now, we have to, uh, uh, as we go along there, that idea of illegal immigration, um, obviously everyone will have heard of and will play into the idea of the white paper. The white paper, the infamous white paper, limiting Jewish immigration um, into Israel. Um, this is something which obviously 1937, 1939, when it finally comes out, um, this is the idea, really, the implementation of uh, um, the recommendations both of the Shaw Commission and of the Peel Commission. Now we have a specific policy of limiting Jews coming into Palestine. At the time, obviously, we're talking about the start of World War II. We've already seen all of the implications of, uh, um, of, of the Nazis taking control of Jewish life and, and really about to start with the caste. And at the same time, what are the British doing? They're limiting Jewish immigration into the land of Israel. Now, Luckily, it must be said um, that uh, uh, the white paper had its had its advantages. The white paper in 1939 said we're going to limit uh, uh, um, Jewish uh, uh, immigration. On the other hand, and what's less discussed from the white paper was the only spark of hope was that the white paper rejected the recommendation of the Peel Commission to partition the land of Israel. But that's really the only form of expression that we'll see of that. As we know, the British uh, uh, um, didn't really uh, carry on with that idea. And really, it was the British who were a major driving force behind um, the, the, the newly constituted uh, um, United Nations. The League of Nations falls apart with World War II. The United Nations replaces the League of Nations. And immediately, almost, you have this idea of a partition plan uh, uh, for Palestine. And here we have uh, um, the, the, the Jewish country, which is really the, the greeny blue, and the Arab country in brown. Um, as we all know, um, the Jews accept the petition plan, the Arab countries uh, reject the petition plan, and they start with a, a, a war to uh, um, exterminate uh, um, Israel, um, going to Israel's uh, uh, um, war of independence. I apologize. Every ex-army person has to have a map where you have troop movements, um, so just to explain, you have this idea of uh, around here in this middle area is the petition plan was meant to be the Arab country. The Arab uh, nations invade. They push Israel back um, for a while until Israel manages um, to, to push the Arab armies back, gaining land both in the north in the area of the Galil um, at the top of the map and in the south, pushing back all the way past uh, uh, um, 
the, the original line of the petition plot to this line here, which you can see very faintly um, is the 1949 armistice lines that what's called or will later be called the green line. Um, and there you have um, that idea of finishing up the comparison, obviously on the left-hand side um, of the screen. This is the petition plan and this is Israel after um, after of independence, um, creating this, this really uh, uh, um, much more substantial area for Jewish life and pushing back the, the Egyptians on the one hand into, into the Gaza Strip and the Jordanians that will remain um, of, uh, um, of, of Judea and Samaria. And that really is where I will uh, um, and possibly just point out one of the most fundamental uh, um, breaches of the, of, of, of the mandate. Obviously, the mandate starts in 1922, as I said. Its sole purpose is to empower the, the, the United Kingdom to create in this entire area of Palestine, in this entire area of Israel, a homeland for the Jewish people. Um, as we said, the White Paper rejected the idea of a, of a petition plan. So when Jordan comes in and occupies the area of Judea and Samaria, illegally, from all intents and purposes, specifically from a legal point of view, um, what would you then think that the British would say to the Jordanians? They just created Jordan. What should they have said to the Jordanians? It's very clear. You have nothing to do in this area. You are required to leave. You have your state. We made good on our promise, and now leave. Instead of doing that, um, in 1950, um, the British will really lay that final uh, um, layer of betrayal of the, the uh, of the mandate. When in 1950 they will recognise the unification of the East Bank with what is now called by the Jordanians the West Bank. This term, the West Bank, which we so know today, has no historical background in the petition plan. It's referred to as the hilly area of Judea and Samaria. But now Britain will say, in breach really entirely of the, of the mandate, not only are we not going to require the Jordanians to leave that area, but we're actually giving official diplomatic recognition to the fact that the Jordanians have illegally occupied that area. Um, luckily for the rest of the world and definitely for Israel, um, the British were only one of, only one of two countries um, that recognized the Jordanian uh, occupation and annexation of Judea and Samaria, just the United Kingdom and Pakistan. Some people also say Iraq, but uh, uh, um, that's not uh, uh, certain. And so really this is the final betrayal of the mandate saying that we are not only gonna ignore our international commitment to give this entire area to the Jewish people, we're actually going to recognize foreign intervention and foreign sovereignty over that area. That's incredibly helpful. I'll tell you why from, again, the layperson's point of view is when people like yourself recommend that we read these documents and, and change the way we look at things, the um, betrayal of the national homeland we think ends in 1948 when the Israelis, plucky little tribe, got their independence back against five invading armies, including a Jordanian army run by British officers, which, which is almost funny if it wasn't so tragic. Um, and uh, it, it brings us to really up to the present. Now I'm looking at the time, and I think we only have three, four minutes, you and I right now. So I guess um, I'd like to bring this back to, to you as an Israeli living, working, um, arguing in the state of Israel. Um, is the Israeli government going to celebrate this 100th anniversary of the mandate this year, or is it going to disappear from the schedule? Do you know, could you tell us here in the diaspora anything about that? So, so, so I think that Israel uh, attends to celebrate the, uh, um, the more current events of Israel and the, 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 the more contemporary history of Israel from the War of Independence, celebrating Israel's Independence Day, um, and really taking that on as the national identity and the national holidays. 
there are the three days, obviously, which which should be really signaled out. One of them being uh, 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 the second of November, which incredibly was the date that I went into the army. Um, the second being uh, obviously um, the date of the San Remo uh, con convention and conference, um, and the third being the the the, the, the centennial of uh, uh, the mandate. But I think really we go back there to your original question, whereas. I think now the modern day state of Israel, as much as it doesn't necessarily see um, the Bible as its source for its legitimacy um, to exist today to its full extent, that that biblical reference is still there. And so when you're talking about the idea of, of, of celebrating um, Israel's, uh, uh, um, uh, Israel's even day of independence, we don't celebrate our independence day based on the, uh, the Gregorian calendar. We celebrate our Independence Day based on the Hebrew calendar. So hey er will be the date that everything is being celebrated. Um, as I oh, said, okay. uh, mentioned before, Yud Zai, Yud Chet Tammuz, the 18th day of Tammuz, isn't a day of celebration really um, in the Jewish calendar. And so it's something which is, is much more difficult to celebrate today, but it is something which um, Israel, I think, is talking about more and more as time goes on, recognizing that we don't only hold the biblical right to this country, but also international uh, uh, legitimacy from uh, um, dating back from from uh, really yes. and Remo and. Well and um, my last question, which I know could trigger a, a very organized lecture, but I'll ask you to to. Uh, take into account the time considerations, is that um, there was this wonderful concatenation where the, Israel, the, um, the needs of the Jewish people to reestablish sovereignty after World War I and the international community were, were um, in sync, and then that unraveled and continues to do so today. So maybe it's simplistic to say, why do Israel's enemies ignore the the um, mandate for Palestine as a legal document? Um, oh, the, the answer to that is very, 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 very simple, because they can. Um, because the international community itself has tried its best to deny uh, um, the validity of the mandate, to expunge the history of the mandate, to say, well, after the mandate, we made this decision of the, uh, the, the petition plan um, in 1947, and we don't really care if the Arabs accepted it or not, um, and but but that's going to be our go our goal, um, and we're going to try and push that all the way because really we don't want to fight um, with the Arab countries. It became obviously much more of an intense conflict as 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 oil was discovered and and oil became mm -hmm. such a yeah. tremendous uh, uh, resource um, for the whole world, um, and so so you have that really meeting of uh, of, of of, of, of both ideas and interests, where the, the Western countries, the international community is so desperate for Arab oil and Arab resources, and the Arabs are not willing to accept um, anything related to Israel. There's actually a, a 1951 um, report from the UN of the discussions between the Arabs and the Jews after um, uh, Israel's war of independence, how it would work itself out and how the, the petition plan could be Im implemented it, we're now 70 odd years on. Um, nothing has changed since then. Really, nothing has changed since then. The Phenomenal. idea the, the, the Jews had said, all we want is for the Arabs to recognize our right to exist as a Jewish country in whatever given borders. And all the Arabs have said, and it goes today to the Palestinian Authority all the way through, first agree that Israel should be flooded with all of these so-called refugees, um, so that we can demo, uh, uh, demographically destroy any Jewish uh, um, future in Israel. Um, and, and really, since then, we haven't moved on in 70 years. Um, it's remarkable. And so are, are, are really staying on. We haven't really moved on in, in 100 years. Um, right. that's, 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 that's the basis for ignoring everything. Um, you can rewrite and ignore uh, uh, um, reality and rewrite history as it may be uh, uh, convenient um, for whatever your purpose may be. So if I could just finish off by saying that, you know, we like to think that history progresses and gets better. And at a certain level, Israel is a much stronger state than it was in, as a community in 1920. But from a legal point of view, um, 
Israel is worse off in the eyes of the nations, as they say in Hebrew, than it was in 1920 or 1921. It's, it's a very sobering message or a sobering conclusion. And with that, I'd like to thank you because I, I always learn stuff. You and I have been corresponding for the last few weeks. I'm very grateful, um, very helpful. Your insights are backed up by really solid research, which is rare this day. And, and I'll now hand back to whom? To Irving, to Goldie, to Agnes, whoever. Thank you, Jeff. We're gonna hand it over thank to you. Irving. Thank you so much, Maurice. That was wonderful. Thank you very much. <clears throat> As the co-chair of Canadians for Israel's Legal Rights, I'd like to thank both Maurice and Joff for their insightful discussion about the League of Nations mandate for Palestine. To take us into part two of our program, we are delighted to have Robert Mayer with us. Robert is a prominent Hong Kong-based businessman and retired lawyer. He attended Columbia Law School and joined the international law firm of Kudair Brothers in New York and Hong Kong. Among his many achievements, he co-founded Kadima at Columbia University, as well as the United Jewish Congregation in Hong Kong. Robert is a director of United Israel Appeal Hong Kong and is former chairman of Jewish Times of Asia. In December, 2017, Robert defended on Hong Kong radio the Trump administration's decision to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Robert will speak to us now about what we can, what can be and must be done to reclaim the rights of the Jewish people to the land of Israel, as recognized under international law via the mandate for Palestine under the League of Nations and the United Nations. Robert, the floor is yours. The Jewish people, legal owners or illegal occupiers of the land of Israel. Israel's original land title deed, the 1922 League of Nations mandate for Palestine. I owe a great deal of gratitude to Mark Vandermoss, Canadian founder of IsraelTruthWeek.org, whose pioneering advocacy I have liberally drawn upon in this presentation. Since most of you are neither lawyers nor historians, I will present an advocacy approach designed by Mr. Vandermoss, showing that the mandate for Palestine under international law is the legally binding original land title deed to the land of Israel given to the Jewish people by the nations of the world in 1922. The Palestinian Arabs are the original indigenous peoples of Palestine. The Jews stole our land and are illegal occupiers of Palestinian Arab land. Jewish settlers illegally build on West Bank Arab land. We hear these claims all the time, but are they true? All our lives, most of us have thought that there does not exist Israel's original land title deed to the land of Israel given to the Jewish people by the nations of the world. Wouldn't it be great if we had it? If I could show you a document proving that the accusation of Jews stealing land is false, would you want to see it? Well, we do have it. It's the 1922 League of Nations mandate issued exactly 100 years ago today on July 24th, 1922, which you can read and should read yourself. Only 2% of most Jewish people have ever read it. Some of our considerations in addressing this subject will be the following. The truth, the mandate document exists, and the truth of its existence is enough to directly refute the stolen land propaganda and the entirely false narrative that has been completely fabricated out of thin air that Israel has no legal rights to the land. Truthful terminology. We need to use truthful terminology and not myths to gain control of the narrative. We should refer to Judea and Samaria, not the West Bank or occupied territories, to reconstitution of the Jewish people, not colonization by the Jewish people. That Israelis residing in Judea and Samaria are citizens, not foreign settlers. And that the document is called the League of Nations Mandate for Palestine, not the British Mandate for Palestine. 
Have international promises to the Jewish people been kept or not? Did the nations of the world in 1922 make promises to the Jewish people in the mandate for Palestine or not? Did the nations of the world subs subsequently keep their promises to the Jewish people or not? Can the Jewish people trust and rely on the nations of the world to keep their promises in any future agreement regarding Jewish ownership of the land of Israel or not? The Jewish people are the most oppressed, murdered, ill-treated, discriminated against, and hated people in history. The Jews have a moral right to know whether Jews can trust the world's promises, telling Jews to rebuild their ancient home. The mandate for Palestine recognizes the ownership by the Jewish people of the land of Israel and by no other people. Menachem Begin said in 1981, at all times and whatever the cost, safeguard the dignity and the honor of the Jewish people. The Jews and Israelis have suffered indignity and dishonor too long by being falsely accused of illegally stealing and occupying so-called Palestinian land. The mandate for Palestine exists and it refutes these sordid and untrue allegations. We and the world have a duty to preserve Jewish dignity and honor and show that the international community has already recognized Jewish national rights in the League of Nations mandate for Palestine. Three key documents in the evolution of the mandate for Palestine. I want you to keep in mind during this presentation, the three key documents, tracing the evolution of the mandate for Palestine, recognizing the Jewish people as the sole owners of the land of Israel. The first is the Balfour Declaration of November 2nd, 1917, a statement of policy whereby Britain became the first nation in the world to recognize Jewish ownership rights in the land of Israel. The second is the San Remo Conference Resolutions of April 25th, 1920, which adopted the Balfour Declaration as a resolution for the League of Nations establishment of the mandate for Palestine and recognized the legal entity of Palestine for the first time in more than 1800 years. And third, the mandate for Palestine of July 24th, 1922, which recognized as a matter of international law, sole Jewish national and political rights to Palestine. The Mandate for Palestine, a brief history. The Mandate for Palestine is an act of international law unanimously adopted by the 51 member League of Nations, the nations of the world, after its confirmation on July 24, 1922, recognizing and granting only to the Jewish people as the only indigenous native people of that land, a national homeland in Palestine. The mandate incorporates word for word and codifies the Balfour Declaration of November 2nd, 1917. It recognizes, quote, the historical connection of the Jewish people with Palestine and, quote, the grounds for reconstituting their national home in that country. I will discuss the mandate in detail later. The mandate for Palestine is one of three Class A mandates adopted by the League of Nations. The importance of the Class A mandates is that this category is reserved only for former Turkish territories considered, considered to be sufficiently advanced such that their provisional independence already was recognized. However, they were still subject to allied administrative control until they were fully, quote, able to stand alone. In other words, a provisionally independent Jewish state was envisioned in the language of the mandate under Article 22 of the Covenant of the League of Nations, which created a total of 14 mandates. The other two Class A mandates 
are Syria, Lebanon, and Mesopotamia or Iraq. The mandate for Palestine is a remarkable and a profoundly Zionist document. The words Jew, Jewish, and Zionist appear 14 times in its 11 pages. It recognizes the national and the political rights of the Jewish people only and of no other people and constitutes the legally binding codification into international law of the policy set out in the Balfour Declaration as resolved by the San Remo Conference into inalienable Jewish national and Jewish political rights in Palestine. It constituted binding international law up to the date that the British ended the mandate, mandate and withdrew from Palestine at midnight on May 14, 1948. The British ended their role as mandatory or trustee due to, quote, frustration of purpose. With the Declaration of Independence by the State of Israel on May 14, 1948, the mandate for Palestine expired. However, the national, quote, acquired legal rights, close quote, of the Jewish people in the mandate of Palestine and the obligation of the nations of the world to reconstitute the Jewish national home in Palestine remain valid to this day under Article 80 of the UN Charter and under the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties signed in 1989. Under the international legal doctrine of uti possedidus juris, which means that a new state's borders are the same as before, Israel's borders were and are the exact same borders as the previous borders of mandatory Palestine. The United Nations welcomed Israel as a member state on May 11, 1949, completing the legal steps to Jewish statehood in the Western part of Palestine that began with the Balfour Declaration, the San Remo Conference resolutions, and the mandate for Palestine. At the time of the mandate, the League of Nations consisted of 51 countries of the world, including the major countries, except for the United States, which never joined the League of Nations. However, the United States adopted the identical wording of the mandate for Palestine in a separate treaty with Great Britain in 1924. This treaty was unanimously ratified by the US Congress in 1925, and became US law under the Supremacy Clause Article 6 of the US Constitution. The League of Nations member numbers peaked at 58 countries in 1934. At the end of World War II and the League's dissolution on April 19, 1946, the League of Nations was superseded by the United Nations. The UN Charter in Article 80, the so-called Palestine Article, extended the application of the mandate for Palestine by stating, quote, nothing in this chapter shall be construed in or of itself to alter in any manner the rights whatsoever of any states or any peoples or the terms of existing international instruments to which members of the United Nations may respectively be parties. In other words, the mandate for Palestine remained valid. The mandate originally gave to the Jews all the land both west of the Jordan River and also east of the Jordan River. However, the Eastern Jewish land of Palestine was detached two months later to create Transjordan, the king, which became the Kingdom of Jordan in 1922. This, in fact, was the original two-state solution in 1922. Mark Vandermoss says that God-believing people can see, quote, the fingerprints of God all over the mandate for Palestine as it is perfectly synchronized with the Bible. The mandate for Palestine is the original land title deed for the land of Israel given to the Jewish people by the nations of the world in 1922. The Balfour Declaration, the famous 67 words. During World War I, following Zionist organization lobbying, and in order to garner Jewish support in the United States and Russia, 
for the war effort and to reward the Zionist, not Zionist organizations, Chaim Weizmann, for developing a form of acetone, a synthetic explosive. Arthur Balfour, the Foreign Secretary of Britain under Prime Minister David Lloyd George, on behalf of the British cabinet, issued on November 2nd, 1917, a statement of policy known as the Balfour Declaration. The declaration states that, quote, his majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object. This was the first time that any government had recognized and maintained a policy of Jewish national rights to Palestine. The Covenant of the League of Nations. In January 1920, the League of Nations was established. The Covenant is the first part of the Treaty of Versailles of 1919 and introduced the new concept of a mandate or a trust to help former colonies and possessions of the Central Powers achieve, quote, self-determination until they were ready for independence. Article 22 of the Covenant of the League of Nations called the Mandates Article states, quote, certain communities formerly belonging to the Turkish Empire have reached a stage of development where their existence as independent nations can be provisionally recognized subject to the rendering of administrative advice and assistance by a mandatory until such time as they are able to stand alone. The San Remo Conference Resolutions. In April 1920 in San Remo, Italy, four of the principal allied powers, Great Britain, France, Italy, and Japan, with the United States as an observer, met to deal with the former Turkish possessions of Palestine, Syria, Lebanon, and Mesopotamia, or Iraq. The San Remo Conference achieved the following. First, they heard, had heard presentations by both Jews and Arabs regarding their rights in Palestine. Second, for the first time in over 1800 years since Roman times, Palestine became a, nas a national legal entity again, ending the longest colonization known in history by the Romans, the Byzantines, the Sassanid Persians, the Arabs, the Crusaders, the Mamluks, and the Turks. Third, they approved the final framework of a peace treaty with Turkey, later signed at Sevres and replaced by the Treaty of Lausanne in 1923, and they abolished the Ottoman Empire and obliged Turkey to renounce all rights over Arab Asia and North Africa. Four, they created the three Class A mandates for Palestine, Syria, Lebanon, and Mesopotamia. And Five, they incorporated the full text of the Balfour Declaration, the full text into their resolution regarding the proposed mandate for Palestine. And they also included the entire area of Palestine, including the modern states of Israel and Jordan in the mandate. The mandate for Palestine. On July 24th, the League of Nations Council or executive body approved the, late Le the League of Nations mandate for Palestine, which recognized the Jewish people as the future owners of Palestine. Let's look closely at its, position, its, at its provisions. The document consists of two parts. The first is the mandate for Palestine. And the second is the troublesome note by the Secretary General, that's of the League of Nations, relating to its application to the territory known as Transjordan under the provisions of the new Article 25, incorporating and approving Britain's memorandum. And we'll get to the second part later. The preamble. Please note, the preamble is not merely a series of declarations. It is legally incorporated into Article 2 of the mandate. In the mandate's preamble, the Council of the League of Nations cites five important recitations. First, 
Whereas the provisional allied powers, that's Britain, France, Italy, and Japan, who adopted the San Remo resolution, have agreed for the purpose of giving effect to the provisions of Article 2, that's the mandates article of the Covenant of the League of Nations, to entrust to a mandatory selected by the said powers, that's Britain, the administration of the territory of Palestine, which formerly belonged to the Turkish Empire, within such boundaries as may be fixed by them, and later there were adjustments to the border with Lebanon, the headwaters of the Jordan River, the Golan Heights, a slice of land in the Sinai, and of course the loss of Eastern Palestine across the Jordan, Jordan River. Second, whereas the principal allied powers have also agreed that the mandatory, that's Britain, should be responsible for putting into effect the declaration originally made on November 2nd, 1917, that's the Balfour Declaration, by the government of his Britannic Majesty and adopted by said powers in favor of the establishment in Palestine. Is this all of Palestine? Yes, under the principle of an international law known as uti posedidus juris of a national home. Is that a state or just a home? It's a state, why? This was the entire purpose of the mandate system, especially for the three class A mandates. It being clearly understood that nothing should be done which might prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine. Note that there is no mention of national or political rights of these communities. Third, whereas recognition has thereby been given to the historical connection of the Jewish people with Palestine. And remember that both the Jews and Arabs presented their cases previously. The principal allied powers accepted the Jews' case and to the grounds for reconstituting their national home in that country. And note the important word reconstituting and not creating. After being dispossessed for 18 centuries, the Jewish people were restored as the sole surviving indigenous native people of the land of Israel, deserving of self-determination and a reconstituted state. The mandate of Palestine was actually sui generis, meaning one of a kind, compared with the mandates of Syria, Lebanon, and Iraq, in that its national beneficiaries were the 14 million Jews worldwide at that time, rather than just the local Jewish inhabitants. Fourth, whereas the principal allied powers have selected his Britannic majesty as the mandatory or the trustee for Palestine. Now the Jews at that time, based on the Balfour Declaration and other pro-Zionist government sentiment in Britain and the conquest of Palestine by British General Allenby favored Britain to be the mandatory. Uh, there really wasn't any other choice. And fifth, whereby his Britannic majesty has accepted the mandate in respect to Palestine and undertaken to exercise it on behalf of the League of Nations. Again, please always note that this was not, this was the League of Nations mandate for Palestine, not the British mandate for Palestine as it is commonly misnamed. Britain was to be the administrator or the midwife to the birth of the Jewish state, not its new colonial master or the promoter of an Arab state in Palestine in its place which later unfortunately occurred. Now we'll get to the terms of the mandate. If you haven't read this before, you're reading it now. I'll emphasize six articles relating to the Jewish people's ownership of the land of Israel under the mandate. Article two, the mandatory shall be responsible for placing the country into such political, administrative, and economic conditions as will secure the establishment of the Jewish national home as laid down in the preamble. This is the incorporation of the preamble into the main provisions and the development of self-governing institutions. Jewish national home in the context of the covenants, article 22, discussing provisionally independent states ultimately means a Jewish state. The development of self-governing institutions of course, is necessary for this goal. Article four, an appropriate Jewish agency 
shall be recognized as a public body for the purpose of advising and cooperating with the administration of Palestine in such economic, social, and other matters as may affect the establishment of the Jewish national home and the interests of the Jewish population in Palestine. There is no mention of a comparable non-Jewish organization or non-Jewish interests. The Zionist organization shall be recognized as such agency. It shall take steps in consultation with his British Ma Britannic Majesty's government to secure the cooperation of all Jews who are willing to assist in the establishment of the Jewish national home. The Zionist organization is specifically mentioned as is the prospect of this organization securing the cooperation of all Jews worldwide for the establishment of the Jewish national home. Does this include Jewish immigration to Palestine? Yes, under Article 6. Article 5, the mandatory shall be responsible for seeing that no Palestine territory shall be ceded or leased to or in any way placed under the control of the government of any, for any foreign power. The permanent inalienability of the land of Israel in favor of the Jewish people is underscored by this article. In Article 6, the administration of Palestine shall facilitate Jewish immigration under suitable conditions and shall encourage, in cooperation with the Jewish agency referred to in Article 4, close settlement by Jews on the land, including state land and wastelands not required for public purposes. These are lands that were available. Britain is mandatory is to, fac is to facilitate Jewish immigration and not to restrict it as ultimately occurred. Britain is to encourage Jews close, Jewish close settlement of the land, including state and wastelands owned by the previous Turkish government. No such right is given to the Arabs. Article 7, the administration of Palestine shall be responsible for enacting a nationality law. There shall be included in this law provisions framed so as to facilitate the acquisition of Palestinian citizenship by Jews who take up their permanent residence in Palestine. Nationality and citizenship are attributes of nationhood. Britain is to facilitate Jewish citizenship. There is no mention of Arab citizenship. And Article 11, the administration may arrange with the Jewish agency mentioned in Article 4 to construct or operate any public works, services, and utilities, and to develop any of the natural resources of the country. Question, how can anyone read the mandate for Palestine and state that it does not recognize Jewish national rights to the land of Israel? It is absolutely clear that the international community, the nations of the world and the League of Nations made explicit legal promises to the Jewish people in the mandate for Palestine, establishing the mandate for the purpose of guiding the quote, provisionally independent area of Palestine into full statehood. All the other 13 class A and class B mandates became states. And yet no one today argues about either the validity of their existence or of their borders. Can you think why? The detachment of Eastern Palestine to Transjordan. Some 78% of the mandate for Palestine was the territory of Eastern Palestine, initially included in the mandate for Palestine in July 24th, 1922. However, at the time of the mandate, a deal was already pre-cooked, whereby Britain had decided to give Eastern Palestine to the Hashemite Emir Abdullah bin al Hussein as a reward for him and his family rebelling against the Turks in World War I. And it was for purposes of legally positioning itself against the French that Britain first included Eastern Palestine in the mandate with an option to detach it later. And two months later, on September 13th, 1922, Eastern Palestine was detached as the mandate of Transjordan with Abdullah 
as ultimately as the king. The second document in the jo of the July 24th, 1922 mandate for Palestine, the note by the Secretary General relating to its application to the territory known as Transjordan under the provisions of Article 25 of the mandate affects this detachment transaction. And it states in the territories lying between Jordan and the Eastern boundary of Palestine, that's toward Iraq, as ultimately determined, the mandatory shall be entitled with the consent of the Council of the League of Nations to postpone or withhold applications of tr such tr provisions of this mandate. The British clearly envisioned severing Eastern Palestine from Western Palestine for their own political reasons. Britain submitted a memorandum to the Secretary General, which was incorporated in the note. It invited the League of Nations Council to pass a resolution that the provisions of the mandate for Palestine are not applicable to the territory known as Transjordan. Transjordan it was described as, quote, all territory lying to the east of a line from a point two miles west of the town of Aqaba on the Gulf of that name, up the center of the Wadi Araba, the Dead Sea, the River Jordan, to its junction with the River Yarmouk, and thence up the center of that river to the Syrian frontier. You can see on the map in front of you the uh, Zionist map of the requested borders of the Mandate of Palestine. The Zionist organization had presented to the San Remo Conference a map including, I'll go back to that, a map including land east of the Jordan River, whereby two and a half of the biblical 12 tribes of Israel, that's Reuben, God, and half of Manasseh, dwelled in an eastern area about 10 miles uh, from the Jordan going eastward to the tracks of the Hejaz Railway, as well as the Golan Heights, land in Lebanon south of the Litani River, and a slice of Sinai. The note was approved by the Council of the League of Nations on the same day as the mandate for Palestine, that's July 24th, 1922. And as I said before, it went into effect two months later on September 23rd. The result was that Eastern Palestine or Transjordan was separated from the mandate of Palestine. Jews were not allowed to settle in or become citizens of Transjordan which ultimately became the country of Jordan. The Jordan River became the clear boundary between Israel and Jordan. The mandate for Palestine gave original Jewish land located east of the Jordan River to the Arabs. This was the original two-state solution made from Jewish land. The mandate for Palestine returned to the Jewish people the land west of the Jordan River, including all of Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria for their national home. Nowhere in the mandate for Palestine are Jews excluded from living in Jerusalem, Judea, or Samaria, nor are Arabs given any land in Western Palestine located west of the Jordan River. The nations of the world recognized that the Jewish people had the best claim to the land located on both sides of the Jordan River. But to reward and appease the Arabs, 78% of the land promised to the Jews, that is Eastern Palestine, was taken and given to Hashemite Emir Abdullah bin al Hussein, who later became King Abdullah. Today, the nations of the world want to divide Jewish land again in a second two state solution. This is neither fair nor just because it was already done in 1922. We need to first acknowledge the original two-state solution for Palestine under the mandate for Palestine before we discuss any further solutions. Palestine was always Jewish land. The name Jew comes from Judea. After the failure of the Jewish Bar Kokhba revolt in 136 CE, the Roman emperor Hadrian de-Judaicized the, the name of the land of Israel calling it Syria Palestina, as an insulting memory of the long defunct Philistines 
originally a seafaring people who were the arch enemies of the Jews and who disappeared from history more than 700 years earlier in 604 BCE. If there were to be another two-state solution tomorrow, the Jewish people would be tacitly admitting that they have illegally occupied a portion of their own land being given to the Palestinians in this new two-state solution. This is both untrue and would be a terrible stain on Israel and, Jew and on Jewish history, as well as an insult to the Jews who died to build and to defend the state of Israel. The Jews did not steal the land, they own it. This is clear from the mandate for Palestine, unanimously adopted by the nations of the world in the League of Nations, and continued by the UN Charter, Article 80. We must have truth in order to have peace. There can be no peace based on falsehoods. Solutions cannot be built on lies. The state of Israel and the Jewish people need to stand up with dignity and honor for their rights and show how they've been horribly treated by the completely false narrative currently arrayed against them. Did the nations of the world make promises to the Jewish people in the mandate for Palestine? Yes. Were these promises kept by the British as mandatory and by the nations of the world who still falsely claim that Israel is an illegal occupier? No, the promises were not kept. Did hundreds of thousands of Jews tragically die in the Holocaust because the promises of the nations of the world to the Jewish people were not kept? Yes. Can the Jewish people trust the promises of the nations of the world in any future solution to the Israel-Palestine issue? No, not if the prior promises remain broken. I'm now gonna to switch to a, another topic, the status of the land of Israel according to Islamic Sharia law. Why am I discussing this subject? I'm discussing it because the role of Islam is the elephant in the room, in my opinion, in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and its important role is ignored by Western commentators and analysts. Have you ever noticed the complete intransigence of the Palestinians in negotiating and agreeing with Israel about any final resolution of the Israel-Palestine issue? The Palestinians rejected every final peace initiative including the two negotiations held in the United States, first by Ehud Barak of Israel with Yasser Arafat in July 2000, and later by Israel's Ehud Olmert with uh, Palestinian Authority uh, President Mohammed Abbas in November 2007. The Palestinian side made no counteroffer to the generous and flexible terms for peace offered by the Israelis in both cases. Why is that, particularly from a nation whose culture is the bargaining of the bazaar? Here's the answer. The Quran, Surah 2, chapter 2, verse 191 states, drive them out from where they drove you out. This divine commandment from Allah has been consistently interpreted by Muslim scholars for 1400 years to mean that once land is conquered, or otherwise obtained by Muslims, it must remain Muslim land forever. Not a single inch of it can be retained by or returned to the infidels. This is the command of Allah in the Quran. Caliph Umar's Muslim army conquered Palestine in the year 636 CE. From the Muslim point of view, and it's correct, it has been under continuous Muslim control since then until the mandate for Palestine took legal effect in 1923, with the exception of the 188-year Crusader period from 1099 to 1187 CE. Islamic conquest of land is, quote, a one-way ticket, according to Bar Ilan University professor Mordechai Kedar. Land can enter Dar al-Islam, al -Islam, the house of Islam, but it can never exit. For Muslims, according to the Quran, the land of Israel has been and continues to be Muslim land since 636 
CE until now. When Yasser Arafat returned from the Camp David negotiations with Ehud Barak, he was asked by an Arab journalist in Arabic, someone I know, why he walked away from the negotiations. He replied, because the Israelis would not give us 100%. Arafat knew that if he had agreed to give up claims to any part of Palestine by recognizing the state of Israel, he would have had his throat cut because of the Quran, Surah 2, verse 191. The Palestinian adv advisor on Islam, Palestinian Authority advisor on Islam, who is also the Supreme Sharia judge of the Palestinian Authority, has stated that the entire land of Palestine is a waqf. That's an inalienable religious endowment under Islamic law. Therefore, it is prohibited for Muslims to sell, bestow ownership, or facilitate the occupation of even a millimeter of Palestine by non-Muslims. The Hamas Charter, Article 11, adopts the same position. This is why we always hear the Palestinian claim to all the land, quote, from the river to the sea. Any further partition of the land now will only lead to more demands for further partitions later until the Palestinians following the Quran have 100%. Why was, however, why was Israel able to make peace with Egypt and Jordan? Both Egypt and, jo and, and uh, Jordan took the position that their responsibility was to regain every inch of Egyptian controlled Muslim land and every inch of Jordanian controlled Muslim land, respectfully, respectively. They succeeded, and that was the price of peace for Israel. They and the other Arab League members decided that it was up to the Palestinians themselves to secure the land upon which Israel exists. Under the Mandate for Palestine, which constitutes international law, it is very clear that the land of Israel belongs to the Jewish people. However, under Islamic Sharia law, the reverse is the case. The land is Muslim land forever. Is there any way to reconcile these two positions? The answer, sadly, in my opinion, is no. Islamic jurists will never accept that international law can supersede the immutable Sharia law given by Allah in the Quran. Israel and the Palestinian Muslims will continue to be in a perpetual deadlock on this issue. So what should Israel do? Israeli professor of Arabic and Islamic studies, Mordecai Kadar, has advised that Israel must always be militarily invincible, invincible. In such case, the Palestinian Muslims, who will never give up their position that they own all the land from the river to the sea, however, may decide that the timing simply is not right for today's generation, and from our point of view, hopefully for future generations, in order to fulfill this Islamic commandment. Thank you very much for your attention to today's webinar. Thank you, Robert. I'm gonna hand it over to Goldie. Thank you, Robert, for an excellent, excellent presentation. To the audience, I just want to say that being fortunate to have such talented speakers, we ran over our allotted time. So the plan that we had for a panel discussion will have to be cut very short. I, I'm not sure how, how much we can go over the time. The intention was to hold a panel discussion where we were attempting to answer the question we are often being asked, what can we do? We have to cut short those, uh, uh, those proposals. I will come to, I, will, I think I will hand it over to Irving to allow perhaps to invite every speaker of the panel to, to propose one, to give one tip to the audience what they can do. And then I will ask Irving to make a closing, his closing remarks and then invite Joyce Aldrich for the surprise uh, that we are holding for the end. Irving? 
Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Robert. Uh, brilliant presentation. Touching on so many points that, that um, we have to come back to in future webinars. Uh, at this point, <laughs> At, at this stage, as, uh, because we're short of time, I'd like to ask each of uh, each of you to to mention the thing that you think we can do and need to do. Uh, most of all, uh, we uh, in general we have three hundred and twenty viewers uh, today. Uh, what can our viewers do to help the process? Uh, Maurice, maybe I could start with you. Thanks, Erin. So, uh, so I believe that the that the foundation of any type of activism in this area, and there is really a tremendous amount of scope for it, is education. It's knowing, it's understanding, as Robert said, um, gave that really, it's it's really a horrible, um, but and and very unfortunate statistic. Two percent of Jews have actually read the Mandate for Palestine. This is an unbelievable document. It is our contemporary deed of title to the land of Israel. It's something that must be read, something that must be read over and over again. When, when our kids go off to university and they found themselves attacked by the Palestinians and their supporters, they should know to recite the, 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 uh, the provisions of the mandate off by heart. It's almost... And, and, and this is really what's called to, to, to really desecrate the, 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 the holy, but it's almost more important to really quote the mandate than it is that they should know to sing Hatikla, our national anthem, because this is our basis. This is how they respond to those claiming Israel is a usurper. Israel has no right to exist. Israel is a colonizer. No, no, and no. This is our title. And so everybody should read uh, um, uh, the mandate. Everybody should learn its provisions and everybody should then use its provisions to say, this is the basis and this is where we should uh, be moving forward from. Thank you. Thank you, And Marie. apart from that, everyone should make Aliyah. It would be so much easier. <laughs> well, it is, that's another discussion actually. <laughs> But uh, Joffrey, uh, would you like to add to Maurice's uh, comments? Maurice is 101% right. Um, I'll keep my comments very short because time is limited. Irving, you and I once went to speak to a senator in the Canadian government who's known as a, a supporter of Israel to try and uh, get her participation. Whoops, gender slipped. Um, in a Canadian initiative with people like um, Mark Vandermas to celebrate the uh, Balfour Declaration and the mandate for Palestine. And within 48 hours, Maurice, you need to know this, it was nixed by the Israeli ambassador. Nixed by the Israeli ambassador. Really interesting. So I think we have to be very honest. If you go to Israel and you speak Hebrew and you watch the media and you speak to friends and family, you'll discover that Israelis are very divided. Most of them, as Maurice points out, have not read the mandate. Most of them, and especially those in the university and the media, feel that uh, Jews and Israelis are occupiers and not owners. And if our hard fighting IDF, high risk taking Jewish brothers and sisters in Israel are saying that to a disproportional uh, degree, one can only uh, conclude that in the diaspora, Jewish institutions of education, private Jewish schools and families are going to be totally perplexed. So again, going back to Maurice and Robert and the rest of us, um, we have to start with the Jewish community in Israel through Imtrutsu and through Canadian CILR to start with the Balfour Declaration, the mandate and re-educate our own people. I'll conclude by saying that we have internalized to a large degree in the Jewish community as Israel, the language of our enemies. Imagine Jews in Nazi Germany quoting to each other over the Sabbath table that Jews are the cause of all Europeans' ills. We're in a similar situation. Thank you very much. 
My apologies, I, we do have to make an end to this very interesting webinar. My proposal is that we're going to collect all the tips that we were going to present to the audience and we will pu publish them in our next bulletin. For now, I'm going to call on, I have one proposal to make and that is for you to get involved and what you can do. David, please call up the petition This petition is to participate, signing the petition, asking the government of Israel to declare Rom San Remo a national holiday. By doing that and calling on your acquaintances and your followers to score sign, this is going to be to happen. We have a promise for one of the members of Knesset that they're going to uh, introduce a legislation to uh, introduce an, uh, to the to introduce a paper to the a bill to the government and we hope that it's going to happen. For now, I'm going to call on Joyce Aldrich, our own Maria Callas, to sing a, a, a short uh, to, to for a live. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting very confused now. All uh, Joyce, please uh, come on board and. Uh, the Vista Capella that you have planned is a two minute ending. And yeah. we thank everybody for joining us. And, and I, I'm over a cold right now, so here we go. Anima me, anima me, anima me. Please stand for Hatifa. to actually work on putting the lyrics of the mandate for Palestine into a song. I think if we sing it, maybe we'll know it. <laughs> um, Israel, hi. <laughs> 